Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered. Like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends... Our conversation begins. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is over. Excuse me if I don't know about El Salvador like I'm ever going to Spain anyway. Stab him in the heart! Christy Swanson. I am so sure. Donald Sutherland. Ah! Ah! Paul Rubens. Ah! With Rutger Hauer and Luke Perry. Buffy, you're not like other girls. Oh! Buffy, the Vampire Slayer. You didn't even break a nail. Directed by Fran Rubel Kazooie. Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, Andy. This starts our, uh, you know, 90s comedies. Thing. Yeah, Final 90s comedies. Series. Not of a of firm. Our... No, <laughs> no, no firm, unlike our no first firm. series. Yeah, the first series was 80s comedies with Coolidge and Heckerling. This one's just 90s comedies. I guess it's with <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, Ruble Kazooie, Heckerling, and whoever the other two are. I'm blanking right now. Yeah. And Associates. And Associates. And Associates. <laughs> <laughs> and associates. Perfect. Perfect. Um, we 
uh, I, I don't remember. It was so long ago that we put this together. I don't remember how we landed on these four movies. I think they were, th- this was the loose collection of movies left over that we wanted to talk about. Well, what well, your hedging the, indicates that you don't no, no, remember no. either. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a sausage factory that we have. And, you know, we, yeah. we had a very particular, um, year of films directed by women that we wanted to, uh, look at. And we had a whole bunch of different films. And we were kind of looking, okay, what what do these films have in common that we could build a series around? And that's kind of how we came to a number of our different series. And sometimes, you know, a certain set of films would lead us down a certain road more easily. We had a few films, and I, I feel like um, when we had a couple of the films on this list, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer... The Last Supper, I think those two were probably two that you're like, I definitely want to talk about those movies. Yes. Um, and so we're like, OK, well, they're both 90s movies. What What else? Yeah, they fit. They fit the bill. So now we can talk about yours. Uh, well, no, I, I think it was just one of those things where we're like, <laughs> what else is on here? OK, 90s. Let's look at 90s. Are the, and, and we're like, OK, 90s comedies. And I think that's kind of how we landed on this set. I don't know if it's two of yours and two of mine, because I don't think any of these um, are likely ones I would have just jumped at the chance to talk about. So they're, they're, what you're saying is they're two of mine and two other movies that you don't care about either. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my overriding opinion. I think that's where we series. landed with this yeah. series. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we'll talk about it sure, surely in greater depth when we do our retake um, uh-huh. episode at the end. Uh, for of our, grievances. Our, our members bonus uh, kind of talking about the whole series and 90s comedy. But that's that is at least, you know, making of the sausage, you know, um, pulling back behind the curtain to reveal how we came up with this particular series. And yeah. uh, that we're starting it off with Buffy the Vampire Slayer right here. We are starting it off with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I uh, I would like to go into this saying that I haven't watched the movie in a lot of years until now. And I come to it with the enthusiasm of the show and the curiosity of how did we get there from here? Uh, so I, I, I oh, don't want to get there me. <laughs> I don't want to yeah, get right. No, you must be in the old same place. Um, I, I come to it not presenting that this is one of Pete's movies because he loves it so much. I hope that ends up becoming clear over the course of our conversation. But I am very curious about how this movie came to be to kick off the sort of legacy of Buffy as an icon. And so I'm I'm looking forward to your opinion on on that. Yeah, it's definitely going to be an interesting one to explore because, like you, I hadn't seen this since uh, probably the 90s. And so it's it was an interesting one. And also coming at it as a person who, unlike you, never got into the show. I maybe yeah. I think you might have sat me down and made me watch an episode or two at some point. <laughs> uh, but I, it's not something I ever uh, latched on to. So. Uh, so yeah. two perspectives of people coming at it, not having watched it in quite a while. All right. All right. Well, the movie was rated PG-13 at the time of its release, and that is for comic vampire violence and drug references. <laughs> so buckle up. <laughs> buckle comic up. vampire violence. <laughs> it's going to uh, be a bumpy night. Uh, and Luke Perry. Hey, want to watch this movie and help us out? Well, you can. If you see an Apple or an Amazon link to the movie in the show notes, or any movie that we talk about in any of our shows, just click on it. It will take you right to the site, and you can rent or buy the movie. When you do this, we get a little tiny piece of the action. Is the shirt a steak? Is it just a steak? Or is it a steak through Luke Perry? Like if we could get an animated... I feel like it needs to be a Paul Rubens. I know, but Paul Rubens, I come out of this movie still liking. <laughs> That's why you'd want it on a shirt. <laughs> yeah, I know, but with a steak. A steak in Paul Rubens. <sighs> Maybe we just need to have a steak dinner. And it's it's a it's a it's table just, setting it's a with plate six plates, and they all have steaks on them. 
Okay. With vampires sitting in each of the chairs. Steak dinner. And it's the last the last yeah. Buffy the Vampire Supper. The last supper. I guess so. And we're blending. And we we're merging we're blending it all movies. together. It's yeah. a blend. The Buffy yeah. the Vampire Supper. And there Elle is sitting right. at one end and Billy Madison is sitting at the other. <laughs> I'm so glad we've Look solved it. All right. We have solved it. Head over to truestory.fm slash TNR merch. You can get the shirts, stickers, mugs, masks, pillows, and more with stuff we're coming up with. And uh, everything you buy over there gives us a little sniff. We would love to have audio reviews from you, our dear listeners. Send us your audio file to reviews at truestory.fm once you watch the movie and you just might get showcased on the episode. You got to get them sent in quick. We do record about two weeks in advance. And, uh, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the season, so make sure you get them in soon. We've got uh, Clueless and, gosh, by the, I don't even Billy. know. By the, by the time this episode is actually out for people to hear this message, um, yeah. we might be done. <laughs> Should I not pretty, have pretty this part? Pretty there? much if you care about Clueless, send us a review. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I don't think so. No, cause... here's what you do. Andy, as we record this, this very day, you have released the schedule of next season. You know, that's true. We we have our, our schedule for next season, for our 2022-2023 season. So yeah. go watch all those movies Send us your reviews. Then you're getting them to us like a year in advance. You are so advance. ahead of the curve. And then we'll hold on to that in a little special file and throw it in the episode. So just send that into reviews at truestory.fm. But Andy, what do you want me to read your mind? Is that what is that what we're doing now? Mind reading at the next reel? No. Pish tosh. We don't count on mind reading around here. We ask you to visit Letterbox, which is the best social media network for movie lovers. And on our Letterbox HQ page, letterbox.com slash the next reel, that's where we posted our uh, watch list for the upcoming season. This season, we're doing series and franchises, and uh, we got some biggies on there. Uh, bit, some controversial picks, some controversial picks, but, uh, you know, I think. Clearly. It's, uh, yeah, I, I think that's. So. I don't think that we could have gotten away with this particular year of films without <laughs> raising some some ire uh, in particular. But we've got a little bit of everything. And that was our intention. A little bit of horror, a little bit of uh, action, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of classics. We got a little bit of everything. And I, uh, for one, am very much looking forward to uh, this particular year of, of franchises. So that's what you need to check out. And I'm, if you have opinions, send them in. We want to share your opinions on the movies we're talking about. Again, head over to letterbox.com slash the next reel, and you can see that. Now, if you fall in love with the thing over there, you fall in love with Letterbox, and you want to you want to interact with us over there, and you remove ads at the same time, just sign up for a pro or patron membership and use the code next reel at checkout, and that'll get you 20% off. And if you're already a member and you're coming up for renewal, you can use that code there too and uh, save that same 20%. Works for renewals as well. Just like Letterbox membership, we have one as well. You can just get that right on our own website. You can sign up as a member either month to month or at an annual rate and you get all sorts of things. Members get early access to every episode. Uh, we have all sorts of bonus episodes. We do a monthly member bonus episode, filling in a gap from a previous series. And members get to vote on the series and the movie for all those. We also do a monthly flick chart re-ranking episode. And we're doing a retake episode. At the end of each series, we do kind of an, over, an overarching view of that series as a whole as another member bonus episode. So that's all stuff members get. Uh, you can learn more at truestory.fm slash TNR membership, where you can also sign up. The most it'll cost you is $5 per month or $55 per year. Here we go. We're talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This is uh, the uh, iconic cheerleader turned uh, demon slayer, Buffy Summers. Uh, this is where it started. The movie, uh, 1992's, directed by Fran Rubel Kazooie, uh, produced in partnership with uh, Howard Rosenman and Kaz Kazooie. Now, Fran went on and uh, with uh, her husband as uh, production partners for the actual series. Um, and so this this was the start of the family of Buffy the Vampire Slayer as it 
moved on. Because they did the series and Angel. Like and they, Angel, that's yeah, right. They, both that's of right. them. Yeah. Right. And and you didn't watch really any Angel. Zero. Okay. All right. No, I, I did not. And I, I think that's a good setup that you celebrate none of the ongoing Buffy the Vampire Slayer universe, and I have celebrated all of it in some yeah. fashion or another. <laughs> so That's a great place that, to start. Great place that, to that, start. That's a stop. Um, I, just to get it out of the way, this, is, this was written by and conceived by uh, Joss Whedon. And if you haven't read the Make Good Vanity Fair article, then he was interviewed in recently. He's still a sociopath. Like, there is nothing that made good about him. He's a problematic individual, and we stand with the... Well, I don't want to speak for you, buddy, but I, I stand with the the people that he has wronged in some feel, cases. Feel free really. to speak for me in this case. All right. He's a sociopath. He's He is a... Uh, things have, have not gone well for him and and rightly so. So we don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about or celebrating Joss Whedon as a creator. But there are a lot of people involved in the entire property uh, that have created something in in many cases really special. And, uh, you know, if if the final version of those properties end up echoing some of of his ideologies or some of his the things that he's he's put into play, I, we, we can't really help that. But but in terms of uh, the property itself, you know, we'll kind of move on a little bit. We will we'll dance around some of the screenwriting things, but only in so far as we're interested in talking about the movie, um, not not louding Joss as a as something more special than he deserves to be. Yeah. Fair? Yeah, yeah. That's fair. It's, yep. it's pretty gross. All right. Yeah. I, I mean, we haven't covered much of his, I think only uh, serenity. Yeah, uh, we did. And and that I think was before that, yeah, we learned that was, so much right, a, right. about him. And I, I think we, our opinion was very different uh, at the time. And, and, uh, but but I I sort of say that for anybody who's a fan of of Marvel Movie Minute, our other show, uh, you know, capturing the beauty and and wonder of the Marvel Cinematic <laughs> Universe one minute at a time. I think art. I think art, Pete. Let's just yeah, the pure yeah. art. <laughs> the all right, one minute at a time. Uh, eventually, we're going to get to Joss Whedon and yeah. uh, the Avengers, and that's coming. Uh, you know, <laughs> sooner. You know, we've got a whole movie between now and then, but it is coming. Uh, yeah, I think we're just going to call Whedon, him so. Tignataro through the entirety of we're... <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Oh, Outstanding. Man. And maybe that starts here, that that uh, <laughs> this movie was written uh, written by <laughs> and conceived of by Tignataro. <laughs> um, uh, so there, there you have it. Uh, Tignataro, Tignataro Christopher Plummer. Take your pick. For, you know, <laughs> they're, uh, all, they're all in it. They're um, all. So there you go. So give me your initial impression. Uh, what do you think of before initial think? impressions? Let's talk. Let's talk about our first experiences with the property. I don't think I even knew this existed, which is it's it seems weird to me that I would have missed this. Um, but I think uh, but I did. I just completely missed this as a, it was a summer movie that came out while I was in college. And I don't know how I it escaped me, but it did. And it was later, somebody mentioned it, and I'm like, what is this movie? And so we ended up watching it. It might have been you, for all I know. And I was like, oh, that was actually a lot of fun. And I didn't really think about it much after that. I still thought it was, you know, it always stuck in my head as kind of a fun property. And then I know they turned it into this whole TV series and everything, which, um, you know, I never, um, I, I wasn't drawn to. And so I, I, I guess I just had it sitting there as like, yeah, that was a fun little movie. And that's kind of how I left it until now. So hmm. I enjoyed the concept enough. I thought it was kind of funny, this idea of this cheerleader who um, becomes this vampire slayer. Like, it's a fun concept. I don't think that was enough for me to go, oh, I want to watch an entire TV series about that. Um, so I think that's kind of how I came to this. Uh, what about you? Um, I it, it is possible that you and I saw this together. I believe the person responsible uh, for it is Monica Frazier. Uh, I think mm. it was her fault because we had a connection between our weird uh, 90210 
fandom. Didn't know anything about the cheerleader vampire bit, but Luke Perry was the draw for her, and I'm pretty sure she dragged me along and possibly you with it. So um, it was it was cute, clever curiosity at the time, and I remember finding the the plays on the California language and uh, the vernacular and the sort of vapid cheerleader story. I remember it being funnier than it than it was on this this watch. I remember having a real affinity for it, but I didn't really have any connection to the to the the vampireness of it um, at the at the time. It wasn't until I was uh, I started watching the show uh, that I realized that that curiosity was something that was going to be leveraged into much, much more and that the character had more depth, I think, than um, they were able to really conjure in the the movie. And that, I think, was interesting because as I was reflecting on the film in particular, this is one of those where the show demonstrated that the small screen had much more to offer than the big screen and that we were able to the, the benefit of being able to spend more time with these characters made the cockamamie premise more grounded and more real and allows us to see many more of the sort of elements of cultural commentary, the commentary on aging, on growing up, on on, um, you know, uh, the the things that come with with age as demonstrated through science fiction, fantasy um, and horror um, are, are really super uh, applicable in the small screen and that they did something really special. And it all started here in a thing that was ultimately not as special uh, to my eye. That it was, um, it, it, it's a fine seed, but I was surprised that the show came from this. I would have imagined this to have been just forgotten to the long arc of history. Well, that's what's so interesting about this, because you watch the movie and it, it seems like, huh, okay, well, that's kind of fun. Yeah. You wouldn't think that it would blossom into anything. And it's probably only because of, of Notaro's <laughs> <laughs> determinism with the property that uh, after being disappointed with what was happening here, he went on to push to actually do something else with it. But in so many other hands, this would have just, you know, been enough to say, okay, there it is, and we don't need to do anything more with it because it's okay. It's not a big money maker. It's enough, and you don't need more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that is the really interesting part. And to have, you know, the the sort of the rights, first of all, and the force of will to believe that this is a story that that is worth telling and to then convince like to sell it in such a way that enough people bought into it. Um, I, I, I do think that that's a special uh, that's a special thing. And, um, you know, as as and I think the overall property is has ended up being being much more than kind of the sum of its parts. So on that point, what were what were some of the high points for you in this watch? Uh, uh, well, Paul Rubens uh, is definitely <laughs> great. Like, I, okay. I think I, and I think that's I guess where I would um, say where I kind of enjoyed at least the, the what was happening is like. I like the I like the concept. You know, I like that we have this this cheerleader who doesn't seem like the sort of person who would fall into this world. And I like kind of that the general way that it plays out. Like there's a there's a history here. You know, you've got she is a slayer and um you've got the the watcher played by I think that's what he is—a watcher, right? By he is Donald the watcher. Sutherland. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And he has to train her to stop these vampires. Uh, I I kind of like the general idea of that. That's probably about where things end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. It's. I mean, it's the problem is the like the entirety of this feels um, just. Not uh, like the the team putting it together didn't have a good focus as to the the 
the overall tone. Like, I feel like it's it kind of bounces around tonally. I feel mm-hmm. like the script is, um, you know, rushed at times. And, and I mean, it, it feels tight. It's an 85 minute film. It moves through fairly quickly. But also, I'm like, God, you could have given us a little more development because some of this stuff just happens so quickly that you just don't care about any of these people. Um, there are friendships and relationships that just seem to th- be thrown together in a very cursory sort of way just to be there. The mm-hmm. entire um, drama, whatever is going on between Lothos and Buffy, kind of that his- history there, it's never really like there's there. I like the general history, like the world building that we have, but I also needed to, you know, have a little more meat to it to make sense. Like, why is she not ready? Like, there's that point where they're all in the, I don't know, fun park or a place with a bunch of, you know, uh, floats. <laughs> fun park exactly in sure. complete disarray. Like, it's not. Like what? Like they just leave sets of like giant sets of trash just a bunch all of over it, the place. Giant animal floats or something yeah. laying around. But yeah. it's like it seems like there's a big confrontation coming. But then Merrick is just like, "No, you can't take her yet. She's not ready." And Lothos is like, "Oh, all right, fine. Uh, we'll come back later." And they yeah. all leave. And I'm like, <laughs> "Wait, what? Like, what was that all about? Like, it made no sense." And and so there's like this, this lack of world build, there's, there's world building, but there's lack of cohesion and, and enough of the right pieces to really help make all of this make sense. And, uh, but again, so much of it just falls to just how tonally off it ends up feeling like it, there's like this really funny concept, but it ends up, I, I felt like. Uh, and I, I feel like, based on what I've read, that it probably falls on uh, Fran Rubel Kazooie's lap as far as kind of like the the tone being all over the place, at least according to, to uh, Joss, where, uh, you know, it feels like, you know, they were just playing up the comedy more and more and more and not playing up the vampire stuff as much as they should have. And so the vampire stuff... It's kind of fun, but it just ends up seeming so stupid most of the time. So yeah. it was it was kind of a kind of a frustrating film to revisit after all this time. It was. I I agree for uh, all the same reasons. I th- I do think I have some some appreciation for uh, Christy Swanson, and uh, I I think yeah. she's she's kind of adorable, right? And and I think she sells the kind of uh, uh, the, the kind of character that they were ultimately going for, right? That this was someone who, you know, has to demonstrate that conflict of ultimate responsibility for life and death for her community and potentially the future of the world. And uh, also really likes to go shopping a lot uh, to the point that 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 becomes a legit trade off, right? <laughs> you know, and I I thought that was I thought that was funny. And I thought her existing at that intersection was um, was cute. I think you're absolutely right about the tone being off. And I think the 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 Kazooie challenge is uh, non-trivial. Uh, you know, when you read how uh, Sutherland being the highest paid actor, kind of the biggest star, was allowed to run roughshod over the over, you know, performances, just improvising uh, inappropriately. Um, and and really, ch- that was one of the things that caused Nataro to walk off the set like that. This was not the movie that that they had had anticipated or had delivered. Um, I, I think that is the Kazooie factor, right? That is the thing the director needs to rein in, whether you're talking about Donald Sutherland or Rutger Hauer or Luke Perry or Hillary Swank, right? I mean, you and and I so I, I think that's a fear of speaking truth to power, right? Something like that. And ultimately, that's what makes the TV show so interesting as a do over, because we don't have any of those issues. Um, tonally, I, I just don't feel like the characters align with one, one another. I find such trouble with the Christy Swanson, Luke Perry uh, relationship. It's just uh, Luke Perry and uh, David Arquette are the worst. They're the worst. <laughs> they're they're laughably the worst in a movie where they're supposed to be comically the worst, right? Like, I I just 
it's just stupid. So I, I don't, I, I don't love it. I don't love their, their position. It doesn't really fit in the, in the overall tone of the movie at all. So, and, and then of course we have, uh, Rutger Hauer as Lothos, the, the master character. He's, uh, and so when we look at Lothos, we've had, uh, the Lothos Buffy flashbacks. And, and I should say we've also had the, what what was his name? Amelin, uh, Paul Rubin's character. We've seen them all in flashback uh, over the years, right? Many, many years, right? As as they've, yeah. you know, she has been, I guess, reincarnated and Lothos has lived and Amelin have lived all those years. And so we've seen them, you know, going at each other. That is, I think, to your point, part of the challenge, the Lothos uh, Buffy relationship over generations is clumsy at very, very best. Um, and so by the time we see her like nestling into his, into his embrace, uh, kind of in the middle of the movie, um, there, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of weight to it. I don't understand it. And, um, it, it's not portrayed clearly <laughs> in the film. It's silly. Yeah. I, I want to jump back real quick. You brought up the, the, um, whatever the issue was with, uh, with Donald Sutherland on set, the kind of yeah. reports that that he had been difficult to work with. Uh, that's coming from Nataro himself, as far as kind of like he didn't want to. Be, he walked off set because of Donald Sutherland, is what it seems yeah. like, and because Sutherland was changing lines. Uh, but again, that also. <laughs> I mean that this is a writer, not the director, who was yes. who was getting critical of an actor's behavior on set, and not necessarily. There, it, it's it's we're coming at this as outsiders. We're not really sure what actually happened. For all we know, Rubel Kazui and Sutherland had a great working relationship. I mean, it sounds like they worked fine together, and they were both fine with improvising and and playing around with the script and trying to find the you know the direction for what was happening and i think for a writer a first time writer at that yeah i mean you might feel um a little hurt and upset that somebody's changing your script that's the nature of the business and i i mean it speaks to the fact obviously uh notaro ended up moving on and moving into much bigger uh, positions, becoming a director, producer, writer, director, producer, taking full control and ownership of all of uh, everything that he was doing. But at this particular point in time, this, this, I mean, it really comes off as, you know, I'm the little writer and I'm, I'm mad that you're not doing what I, um, you know, these are my words, not yours. And that, that whole thing. And it comes across feeling like, I, sure. I mean, Obviously, Rubel Kazooie, as the director, didn't have a good handle didn't on the reins for the way that the film was going. But at the same time, it seems like there might – Donald Sutherland may not have been the problem. You know, I just want to make sure. I don't think that, you know, that's – necessarily the situation you know no and and i i regret if that's what it sounded like i was implying i what my suggestion here and i it was that tig was upset because of that uh that that rubel he was witnessing rubel kazooie letting sutherland walk all over these ca these characters that he had that that tig had written and thought it was inappropriate and got real upset and stormed off and i think the other end of that is the final sequence of this movie was supposed to be buffy burning down the gym it was in the script it was supposed to be there and kazooie and and studio thought, oh, that's too much. We're not going to have we're not going to have her burn down a gym. And they got rid of it to the and, point. And that, Sutherland was supposed to kill himself. Yes. Yes. Sutherland was, was supposed to, to kill himself. Uh, and so that it, to the point that and this gets to my the second half of my point, the impetuousness of Tig in the first place to pick up the TV show and 
uh, well, I'll say two points. Uh, burning down the gym became canon in episode one of the TV show. Burning down the gym is how Buffy Summers ended up in Sunnydale because she burned down the gym, which never happened in the movie that this was supposed to be the reboot of, right? Never oh. happened, right? That's the backstory of the TV show was Buffy burned down the gym. Second... In season two, episode 21 of the television show, it's called uh, Becoming. Uh, it's a two-parter. And they actually portray Merrick in the show, right? And Merrick in the show is played by, uh, oh, Richard Reel, um, who is a, uh, I know you know him. Do you know who I'm talking about? <sighs> Oh, gosh, I'm looking for the... Fa I know you know him. Anyway, uh, he is the most non-Donald Sutherland character you could possibly imagine, and he is presented absolutely characterless. And we get a remake of the first time Buffy goes out to actually slay the first vampire in flashback as she becomes the Slayer. And it is... It is done as a, uh, I, I think, flipping the bird to that sequence in the movie. Uh, it is done to to render that character kind of in history um, yeah, impotent. It was Tig's chance to get flip back. Flip the bird. Yeah. yeah, flip the back, get back, do it the way he wanted to, all these different things. And so that's that's interesting that I, I didn't realize that. That's uh, quite yeah. interesting that... Um, that he went, he went that route. Yeah. So b believe me, I am absolutely on board for this impetuous young writer feeling entitled and burnt by what they were doing to his screenplay. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's fine. Wake up. This is what movies are. And that's okay. Lots of people and lots of opinions. Now, on the other side of that, the thing that kind of burns is that it's possible Tig was right. It's because the end result of this movie is not great. And Donald Sutherland's character is was, I think, largely miscast. Like he was the wrong guy for it. And Oh, you think so? Uh, yeah, I don't I don't care for it. But again, I am oh. so sullied by my opinion of of the show and the way they portrayed the watchers in the show. Uh, yeah. Part of the thing that works so well in the show is that it's a mortal person. And this watcher is this hundreds of year old like wanderer, uh, uh, you know, looking for the the um, uh uh, looking for the slayers and in in the show i just think it's a it's a much more charming and grounded way to look at you know this relationship i it's hard for me to watch this movie in isolation of that and for me not having the connections i kind of i like that sutherland feels so different from buffy like as the person who now has to train her i think that it's it's I don't know. It's, I thought it was kind of fun. I didn't really have any issues with it. And Sutherland is just generally someone who I love so much on screen. I think he's one of those people that just carries a lot of weight that I thought it worked uh, putting him in this role. My complaint would be that I just don't feel like there is enough development with him as a character. So by the time he ends up dying at the hand of Lothos, as it's portrayed in the film, uh, I, I wish that I had had um, stronger feelings about that. You know, I just I, I, I didn't <laughs> yes. feel like it it built to something where I um, uh, it meant something. OK, good. Well, I think we're in rough agreement. Yeah. You haven't weighed in on your opinion on uh, Luke Perry and David Arquette. Can you just lay it down? Did well, you love them so much? So, OK, Luke, let's do them. Um, and then, yeah, let's keep going through some of the cast. David Arquette is David Arquette. You know, he works in context of what we're getting out of this movie. You know, these aren't strongly written characters. They're goofy, comedic high schoolers. And he kind of fits the bill there as kind of the, the dopey loser who hangs out with his uh, buddy Pike. You know, I, I don't know. I, I didn't think much of him. If anything, I was like, wow, they killed him very quickly. And then he was just like this goofy <laughs> vampire. It's like, are they trying to, like, do a spoof version of uh, what was one of the scariest 
vampire scenes in film history, I think you and I would agree from Salem's, Salem's Lot. Lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, but it comes across as really like – like goofy and stupid and because because pike is kind of drunk and he's just like dude what are you on because you're floating well you know it's just like uh, that makes no sense it, you know it's just like his behavior around everything that was happening like he's not sur- he doesn't ever act surprised at all that he finds out there are vampires around so it was i i don't fault luke perry uh i mean david arquette is what david arquette is uh for his small part for luke perry who becomes kind of the the love interest over the course of the film there's just it's it's so flatly written that i didn't think that he really had much to work with at all and so it just kind of comes across as as you know just kind of this lifeless character who pops in and out randomly yes i you just said it lifeless yeah. lifeless. That's exactly what I, every time he was on screen, I felt like all the energy was sucked out of the frame. And a great example of this, uh, the the dopey, ridiculous jocks in their car uh, are, um, are, they pull up in front of the place where the girls are standing outside and the guys are how, how, how hooting at them or whatever and luke perry comes out of the theater and he starts to say something and i think <laughs> it's supposed to be cool but it looks so stupid it, he starts to say something he moves his hand and then he's the thing i think he's trying to communicate is you guys are so uncool that I, there isn't anything i could say that would be enough of a dig on you something like that like i I don't even really get it. It looks like he walks up, terrible. forgets his lines, chuckles to himself yeah. and starts walking that's off. What, like, yeah, <laughs> that's what actually feels like I think happened. <laughs> I, I'm sure he didn't intend us to get that. I'm sure of it. But that is an example of what happens when Luke Perry is on screen and it just sucks the absolute life out of out of the frame. Everything yeah. he does is like that because he brings this brooding 90210 energy to it. And that doesn't fit this movie. No. Yeah. Because he's supposed to be like this dropout punk. And so, like, if he's a dropout punk, first of all, they cast the wrong person because you just yeah. you don't see Luke Perry and buy him as that. David Arquette, sure, but Luke Perry, I'm like, eh, I don't, I don't see him as that sort who has uh, gone down that road. It just, it, yeah. I really didn't buy into that ever. So that yeah. was that was frustrating. Let's go back to Christy Swanson real quick. You you already mentioned you kind of liked her. I think she's yeah. fine as Buffy. Um, I between her and Sarah Michelle Geller. Um, again, I just didn't watch the show. Uh, I like Sarah Michelle Gellar. I think she has a good screen presence, though. But I think Christy Swanson works, especially because I kind of, I mean, I grew up watching her all through the 80s in everything mm-hmm. from like Mr. Boogity and Pretty in Pink and Ferris Bueller and Deadly Friend, really. I mean, God, I loved that movie when I was young. Flowers in the Attic. And so I, I had seen a lot of her leading up to this particular point. Uh, what, and then what's funny is, like, after this, I feel like I didn't end up really seeing any. I, I saw, like, the Phantom and stuff. But largely, I end up missing most of the things that she did after this. So it was 80s into the um, early and mid-90s that I, I watched her stuff. But, I mean, I, I loved her when I was young. Um, I, you know... She certainly is um, has a lot of things that she has had to say lately politically that I'm not as much a fan of. But um, I think for my age group, our age group, there was that period in the 80s, 90s where Christy Swanson was somebody that we likely, you know, was were very easily drawn to. Yeah, I think so. Uh, That was that was it. And I think you I think you said it like after this movie, there was nothing else. In, that yeah. I would in, intentionally have gone to see, and I saw the Phantom. That she was but that's it. <laughs> the fan. Which one was the Phantom? Was that the, what's his name? Um, yeah, yep. from from Dead Calm. Yeah, Billy Zane. Yeah, I saw that. Billy Zane. I have no. I have absolutely no memory of the movie beyond he was in it. I did see it. I did too. I don't remember much. I'm not saying I enjoyed it. I just know that I saw it. Um, yeah. I mean, she she's has kept very busy. You know, she consistently keeps performing in tv and film projects i just it's not the stuff that i'm i'm out there seeking right yeah i totally agree i um i 
I think the I, I just I know I, I don't want to perseverate on David Arquette, but I think David Arquette is the anchor around which I need to uh, or or he is the anchor around which uh, Paul Rubens is tied. This is a problem, I think, with story that we have goofy David Arquette vampire and he's terrible. And we have Paul Rubens, who I like quite a bit and I think is very funny also with his own bit of baggage but I think he's quite funny and I think it's too much having both of them I think we didn't need David Arquette in the movie at all we but not because of David Arquette but because of the character of Benny um I I think could have been a uh nobody also ran other character with Luke Perry's Pike for just a couple of scenes and then dead uh because Paul Rubens serves that role, right? He is the funny, um, awkward vampire servant of Lothos. And I have enough of him. I like him. He's fine. He's what I wanted. And, you know, this is uh, a year after his arrest. And he was doing small parts in things. Like, he was really keeping a low profile, Paul Rubens was. And so this Batman Returns... Uh, you know, he was he was popping up in very bit parts. He wasn't doing mm-hmm. much um, big. And and so um, it was I, I definitely enjoyed him in this film as this comedic character. And, and I think a lot of it is because I felt like if there's somebody who recognizes the um, inherent goofiness of the way that they were putting the story together, it was him. And he was able to amp that up a lot. Like once he loses his arm, it, it's like that's the key that his character needed to become somebody that w- was just a vampire character that you could enjoy. It's 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 like mm-hmm. we're now watching a cartoon. And I mean, that even plays out when you're seeing his protracted death sequences that you know, starts <laughs> in the film and then continues, uh, you know, mid credits. It's very funny uh, to kind of see the way that he's he's doing his uh, his painful death grunts. Yeah, that cracks me up. And so I I, am totally fine with the direction that they they took with him as kind of the comedic character in here. And and that he was enough. Are you do you agree with my uh, assessment that he was enough? Okay. well, he's he's enough. But I think that also speaks to the issues with the the tonal balance that the film takes, because then you have Rutger Hauer, who's Lothos. um, And and I guess you could I mean, if we're looking at at the Donald Sutherland side as well, these two kind of heads of of the two sides are very serious in their tone and everything that they're doing. And and I think that um, it, I, I don't know if that's a, uh, you know, Ruble Kazooie issue or Rucker Hauer was just playing it too seriously or what. But I mean, if, if Paul Rubens is the comedic tone that we really wanted out of the whole film, then I'm not getting that with those bigger characters, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I love Rucker Hauer and I think he works great as a vampire villain. I just don't think that this is the film where we get it from him, unfortunately. Yeah, but, you know, it goes to, I think, the 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 skill of contrasted casting, right? That we have these characters that we, like, I, I can see how there is this incentive to cast characters that so contrast the, the tone of the movie that they become... Um, you know, an anchor to like the straight man to the rest of the joke going on around them. Sure. And I, I can see how you might you might read Buffy the Vampire Slayer as a movie that's doing that. And if that's the case, I think it might be just <laughs> our cup runneth over with that kind of contrast because it becomes a tonal mess and not an icon of a performance of a straight performance in a funny movie. And that's very true because I, I, I mean, Donald Sutherland, Rucker Howard, they both have moments to do to throw a funny yeah. line out in the film, it, even though they're playing it as kind of the straight character. So it's not like they're not given opportunities to kind of to share in that and, and carry the weight wh- while still carrying the weight of kind of the straight man. And maybe it speaks more to the fact that, you know, Paul Rubin's character is kind of a sidekick. You don't need the backstory and all this sort of stuff. But with Lothos, you have this 
somehow weird, complex relationship going on between him and Buffy in particular. Um, it, I mean, I guess it's, I, I don't know. And th- this falls into the kind of the struggle because it seems like there's all these slayers. But in reality, it's the slayer is always Buffy reincarnated is the way that it really seems. It's not like there's just all slayers all over the world and Merrick just has to find them. At least that's not what it, it's made out to seem. That's another thing that is changed for the show. Yeah, it it feels a little confusing because also I was just like, well, then wouldn't it be smart for Merrick to like once he's killed off one of the Buffies until she grows up again and until Merrick finds her and trains her, he's got to have a hell of a long time to run amok and and cause all sorts of havoc. You know, it's not like, yeah. you know, this little two year old Buffy is going to come get him. Right. <laughs> Right. That's right. He's got years. And what happens in the, this is a part of the challenge of this particular mythology is what happens in those intervening decades with the vampires? Like, don't they really go just bananas for 15 years until she saying. becomes a right. slayer? Right. They have all this freedom. Like, that's their yeah. perfect window. Oh, I thought to you were talking up. about Merrick. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, yeah. I thought you were saying, what is Merrick doing? He just, you know, wine tasting. But you're right. That's it. Like the the master, the vampires are going bonkers. That's the whole thing. Now, in the mo- in the show, this was fixed. And it gets to the point that I feel like they know that this was uh, a nonsense thing. As soon as one slayer dies, another just happens to turn into a slayer. Like, yeah. And that's why on the show, you actually have crisscrossing slayers when uh, when Buffy dies, uh, and but is brought back to life in the time that she dies. Like she it turns out she wasn't really dead. Like, you know, she was resuscitated. Uh, another slayer appears in, you know, New Zealand or whatever and and ends up on the show. So there are multiple crossovers where there are slayers of the same age, not because they were born and aged 16 years overnight, but because they just were turned into slayers somehow. Yeah. Like magic. Interesting. A lot of magic. Yeah. So I'm not, I I don't know, I'm probably misstating the lore, but that is something that was fixed. But I mean, but to your point, though, it, it, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly it. They, there was a bigger set. Well, and who knows? I didn't see the original script before the studio got a hold of it, before the Kazooies got a hold of it and started changing things. I, so who knows how much of the full set of world building rules had even been created by this point? It could yeah. have been that this particular film was what Tig needed to go, oh, I forgot these things and this doesn't make sense and actually use the time from the time this came out to the time that the show uh, went live to f- sort the rest of that stuff out. Yeah. So in in that sense, this becomes like training wheels. Yeah. It's and and it's hard not to watch the film now and see it as training wheels. Yeah. It really it does feel to me like it was a it was round one. Right. Yeah. One more thing about about Swanson. What is your impression of the physicality of Christy Swanson after we get the the training montage? As a film watcher, it and 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 somebody who knows how things are done, I've been ruined because as I watch things in film, you you hit a point where you're like, well, that's obviously Christy. Well, that's obviously not. Well, that's you know, and you can start pinpointing like when do they cut <laughs> between yes. the stunt person and the <laughs> actor, and it's kind of a fun game to go like who's who. And and I mean the the stunt double looked great. It was, you couldn't really tell. <laughs> But there were some great like uh, floor moves, like with all the backflips and everything. And then it cuts just as as Christy like pops up and like, yeah, yeah, and, I know. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but in context of it, it works. I also, in context of the the way the film is structured, you know, she comes out of the gym and there's I don't know thirty vampires all standing conveniently <laughs> in a couple lines. And what does she do? I'm gonna. I'm going to do backflips and, and uh, you know, front uh, rolls and all this stuff out into the middle of all of them. They're just going to stand around and watch. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll fight them all. It's like right. there, there are a lot of opportunities. And it seems like maybe just doing those floor routines is not the best way to avoid getting attacked by vampires. <laughs> This was another thing that I think they fixed that, you know, Sarah Michelle Geller and all uh, over the course of the number of seasons, you know, however many seasons, seven, eight seasons, they 
they I think as performers, they just got better at interacting with the stunt team. And so you could tell the cuts, uh, you know, in, in fewer instances, I think, over the course of the season. I think that that's just the benefit of having so many years to practice with the same stunt folks. It, was, it ends up being a much more cohesive kind of action piece. Well, and unfortunately, they 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 have so many moments in the script. And again, I don't know if this is TIG's script or revisions, but there are there are lines where, you know, when she's training, uh, where Merrick tells her, you know, it, it, that was just one. But if there were more than one, you would have been dead. And it makes it seem like it's it's and, and I know she's going through a training process so she can handle this. But when she comes outside, she's the only one like she is it as far as the Slayer. Right. There's yeah. no other Slayers helping her. I mean, I know technically Luke Perry is kind of helping inside. Uh, he has his holy water in a ridiculous he's chucking, way. Chucking is splashing around his holy water. Uh, a lot of vampires are dead inside. Let me just say that yeah. when the principal decides he's going to give out his detention slips. <laughs> There are a lot of dead a vampires uh, on the floor. And yeah. so I struggle with that. But anyway, the point is, they have these scripted moments about how she's not going to be able to handle herself if there are a lot of vampires. And then at the end, they have her surrounded by several dozen vampires, and she's totally fine. It's like nothing to her. And, you know, there were a few different instances where I noticed this, where they had scripted things in one way. Um, and then they it's like they didn't check the script. Like, I think she says that it's been three weeks that she's been training. Um, mm -hmm. But then she's talking later about, like, um, the reason that she has to go to um, cheer at the basketball game, because she's like, I've already missed three cheer sessions and I have to so I have to be there or they'll think something's up. I'm like, you've been gone for three weeks. I would think that you like I don't know. It's just, it's like, there's probably cheer at least three to five nights a week. And so again, it's a small thing, but it's like, those are the sorts of things that just build up over time as you're watching a movie where it's like, yeah, it sounds a little phony. That doesn't make sense. And it just leads to something where it's like, God, this script needed so much more work. The director that needed a director who was fully paying attention to all of this stuff and could have really guided it in. Uh, to make it a more cohesive, stronger film. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it just ends up being a mess. I don't, I, I mean, I, I I think the the film accrues debt that never resolves by the end. Yeah. And, and to the point where I responded strongly to this sequence when the principal is giving out the detention slips and it cuts to, um, over to, um, what's her name? The friend, uh, Hilary Swank. Yeah. And she's all upset, standing by the gym wall, and the principal comes over and pushes her in the forehead, slamming her head against the, the collapsed bleachers and knocking yeah. her out. That, that like, felt like a punchline onto all of the debt that this film has collected over the course of its attempts at funny. And, uh, and it just, I mean, it, it made me really resent that experience. <laughs> It just was so bad. It's so well, bad. And that, to me, spoke to a lot of those elements that that felt very kind of TIG, woman Haiti in here yeah. of like, uh, it, it also is of the time. I and mean, we saw plenty of, of toxic films from the 80s and 90s already that, that have things like this. But it just, coming from him, it just makes sense. Where it's like, you know, as the principal pushes her into the locker and knocks her out. Even later, when she's, uh, you know, when we have the kind of the news reports going on during the credits, and she's just, you know, so out of it that she's giving her Miss America speech or whatever. Like, it's, it's yeah. such nonsense. Also, you have those moments when, when Buffy uh, is running, trying to stop the basketball player vampire, and and there's a whole bunch of Harley guys weirdly parked outside the high school. I wasn't sure what was going on there. <laughs> and they're like, hey, baby, you want to get take a ride with a real man or whatever he says? That just felt awful. And then she knocks him out and takes off on his bike. And then there's a dyke joke. I was like, oh, yeah. geez. Oh, this is this. That felt so uh, not just of the time, but very much of this particular writer. And it just it just ends up leaving kind of that sour taste in your mouth. It really does. And it's one of those things that is just so dramatically changed with the gift of of hindsight. Right. Like yeah. we would watch this movie very differently if it weren't for 
everything that's come out. I don't know that that's necessarily true. It's offensive whether or not, you know, we have that sort of historical color commentary, but it's it certainly ages even more poorly. Yeah. I mean, but was that sort of writing uh, that kind of um, that diminished women? Was that in the TV show, too? Because, I mean, it's it's the obviously more connected directly to to the writer. I mean, it was it was his baby by that point. It's really it is really interesting that you say that because there is there is some of that. And it in again, with the gift of hindsight, you just don't like it's hard to for me to understand how he for so long had accrued the reputation as being a feminist, you know, writer and director in Hollywood. And because I, I have a hard time seeing it. And I remember having a hard time seeing it before, but, you know, it's it's even harder now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's just a lot of misogyny all over the place. And it's um, um, it's hard to watch. The show, I think, does a better job at it because it's balanced with some uh, with more pro uh, sort of feminist initiatives in the movie and strength of, of these of the strong central characters working together. There is a whole I, I think part of it is he made a whole, you know, last two or three seasons around a lesbian relationship. And um, that ends up being being pretty special uh, over the course of the show. So, yeah, um, you know, I, I guess it's all on the balance sheet. Yeah, right. Right. Um, there are some other uh, faces that are just worth mentioning. We don't need to talk about it, but Stephen Root was the principal. Yeah. Uh, and then uncredited, you have Ben Affleck as one of the basketball players, little baby Ben, yeah. and uh, Ricky Lake, Seth Green, and Alexis Arquette all pop in as um, characters in the film. So it's kind of fun to see uh, some recognizable faces in there. I love that Seth Green was in it and, and made the, the jump to uh, the show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, series regular. Yeah. He nice. was a werewolf. Ah, uh, oh, okay. Show. Gotcha. So, uh, Rubel Kazooie, um, Fran Rubel Kazooie only, I think, has directed one other film in 1988 called Tokyo Pop. She definitely has a connection with Japan. Um, she and her husband, Kaz Kazooie, um, and their company, Kazooie Enterprises, their whole thing was uh, doing independent film d- distribution in Japan distributing U.S. films there, and then also bringing Japanese films here to the U.S. market. Um, that They did quite a bit of that work, and then she made that film Tokyo Pop in 1988, which she co-wrote and directed, and it received some pretty good acclaim uh, at the at Con Film Festival, uh, where it premiered. But then, like, I, I don't know if it's because of the lack of clear sense of a director's hand in this film, but it really kind of kept her from, I don't know if it kept her from directing or she just decided to shift more into the specific producing of the properties. And uh, honestly, I don't know. I I guess I was a little surprised that she ended up involved for as much as she was considering it seemed like uh, Tig had an issue with uh, how this ended up coming out. Yeah. And, you know, once again, Hollywood, right? Like, yeah. Stuff right. got to get made. Yeah. And um, so, I, you know, uh, and the, the team around the, the that grew around it, that get, those that came off of the movie and those that ended up on the show ended up doing some really fun stuff. So, I, I mean, I feels like that's OK. Um, and I know that there was talk, at least as of 2018, uh, that the Kazooies were actually working on rebooting Buffy, but I have a feeling that everything that happened with, uh, with Tig ended up probably putting the kibosh on that. Yeah. I, I hear they were going to do it as a, uh, that the Buffy character was black. So, you know, I guess that makes it different enough. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think you're right. The only other thing that I thought was interesting was back when Tig had um, first written this, he sold this to to the production company Sand Dollar. Um, Sand Dollar Productions is Dolly Parton's production Dolly Parton, company. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that's a name that I I don't know. Did she end up staying connected at all through the rest of the properties beyond this, or was it just for this film? No, it was that I think they stayed on. Um, Did they? Yeah, they were responsible not just for Buffy, but for Angel too. 
I at least now I I know I remember the Sand Dollar logo in the first at least the first two or three seasons of the show. I'm I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, under the name Sand Dollar Television. OK. Um, in partnership with 20th Century Fox. So they, they were with them for the long haul. Gotcha. All right. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So it was, yeah, 20th Century Fox, Kazooie Enterprises, David Greenwald Productions, and Mutant Enemy Productions. Grr, arg. Hmm. Gotcha. The only other thing I was going to bring up is the fact that this is this is our 90s comedy series. And if anything, as I revisited this, I'm like, hmm, I don't know if I would have classified this as a comedy when I revisited it. I think the concept is comedy. Maybe the intention was to make it more comedic, but it doesn't end up coming across as something that I would just straight up call a comedy. I guess it's billed as a comedy horror, but uh, if anything, it's very light on both fronts. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it was if it was light on both fronts or if it was just like, you know, an attempt at an attempt at comedy that we didn't get. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I guess I should say is the lack of comedy on the movie or on us. Well, then again, I mean, I guess at the time when I first saw this in the 90s, I did think it was funnier. Like, it stuck with me. And maybe it's maybe truly this is just a product of its time and of my age, you know, where yeah. I felt that it was a, a very funny vampire comedy at the time. And now as I revisit it, I'm like, eh, I don't think that's true. Yeah. Um, I was, oh, geez, I was looking for the stunt coordinators to see how many of them went across to the show because the, the show had just a, a massive sort of cast of stunt coordinators that stuck with it from beginning to end. And uh, it doesn't look like there, there are any that made the leap as far as I can tell. I, and, and probably better for it too, because, that was one thing I'm watching this movie and, and my son and I are watching it together. And his first comment was, God, this fighting looks terrible, mm -hmm. uh, which which is interesting for somebody who just looks at fighting for the, you know, the flash of it, like to notice just how sloppy so much of the fighting was, I thought was good. The other thing is that the makeup and the, the vampire effects was, you know, was again, it felt like alpha one, like a draft concept for what they um, what they really wanted to do. And, you know, budgets being what they were, probably that was definitely also uh, something that was fixed. Yeah. All right. That's all I got. All right. Well, uh, we will be right back. But first, our credits. The Next Reel is a production of True Story FM Engineering by Andy Nelson, music by One Eye, Oriel Novella, and Eli Catlin. Andy usually finds all the stats for the awards and numbers at the-numbers.com, boxofficemojo.com, imdb.com, and wikipedia.org. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for our show. Uh, well, I feel like we we've, we've possibly overplayed. Oh, we've, we've talked our about the TV show. remakes plan. Yeah. <laughs> There's been plenty of stuff about the uh, about the TV show. Interestingly, they never like I've never heard talk about circling back to make another film. Has there ever been talk about like taking Sarah Michelle Gellar and her version of the story and like bringing it in to make kind of, you know, like X-Files no. did? Is there yeah. going to be the no, Buffy? I've never ones? heard. No, I've never heard any talk of that. Interesting. Ever, ever, ever. Interesting. Uh, there was a, there's a, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like motion comic, comics, lots of comics. Tig is yeah. big into the comics. And um, was there an so animated there, show too? There was an animated show uh, they've done. I, I mean, just and for so long, the fandom was super aggressive. And so there was always something coming out in the Buffy verse to feed the fandom. Yeah. And so, you know, from from comics to animated shows to motion comics to it's it's all out there. I don't know. There's probably a podcast. Oh, <laughs> I've never, I'm I've never sure. looked. I am I've never sure looked. there's a Buffy verse podcast. Yeah. Uh, so interesting, interesting. All right. So that's what I know from that. But do we know anything about awards? Did it do any awards? <laughs> well, you know, this is a film um, at the time it had one award nomination. Um, that was it because, you know, it's not the sort of thing that 
that really, well, it's a genre film. So if anything, it's going to give you the genre award. And it wasn't that well done. So it ended up only getting one. And that was Christy Swanson getting nominated for Best Actress for the Chainsaw Awards. These are Fangoria's awards that they uh, that they release. And it looks like she lost to Virginia Madsen for Candyman. And I can't argue with that. That's That's a good choice. Although the other options, um, Anne Pariad from Innocent Blood, I'm not familiar with that one. Also Sigourney Weaver, Alien 3, and Winona Ryder, Bram Stoker's Dracula. So um, there's some stiff competition that year. I think this, I, my bet is, I haven't looked at the budget, but my bet is this movie made money. Did it make enough? Like, did it more than pay its debts? A Rubel Kazooie's film cost a cool $7 million to make, which is about $12.8 million in today's dollars. This movie opened July 31st, 1992, big summer movie opposite Death Becomes Her, BB's Kids, and the limited release of Enchanted April. The film went on to earn $16.6 million, which is about $30.4 in today's dollars. Dollars That lands the film with an adjusted profit per finish minute of nearly $205,000. Okay, so it made some money. It, it made did. Some money. It made enough of a success for people to not complain about it losing money. Yeah. You know, the fact that it made enough at the box office probably is what TIG needed to sell it as a TV show. All right. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm glad we talked about it. I'm glad we got it because I just am glad we have the opportunity for me personally, to reflect on it as uh, the the precursor to something that I do appreciate much more. Um, so uh, I but I, I can say with some confidence, this is not a good movie. Yeah, I, I will say, well, you know, we there was a day, Pete, um, and I don't even know if it's available anymore, but we had uh, created a glossary of terms that we came up with. And I know there was a term we came up with for a film that we had fond, fond memories of as a kid or just as a, you know, earlier in our life. And we revisited it and realized that just how bad the film is. And we've tainted those old memories. Uh, for the life of me, I don't remember what the term what was that we came up with for that in our glossary. But there was a term um, because that certainly happened here. This was a film I had fond memories of uh, from uh, yeah. those memories. Having watched it back in the 90s is a fun vampire movie. Now that I've revisited it, I realize, gosh, this is just a sloppy, not well put together film and uh, it was a little bit of a disappointment just a bit that was that was so funny so i we have the next real glossary it, it is up on the website it. it's it's at truestory.fm slash glossary and there are some really funny uh <laughs> really funny terms on on here do you remember for example sway's religion <laughs> that sounds um so okay i'm gonna guess sway's religion um, something, it's Patrick Swayze, um, saying, so, I, I would guess saying something bad, sacrilegious about, uh, a Patrick Swayze movie that we hold in great esteem. <laughs> You're very close. I realize now that we don't go look at this because this is going to be a quiz that I get to do for you from time to time. The Swayze Village <laughs> is a sacrilege in remaking any Patrick Swayze movie, whether it's held in high esteem or not. Origin. When the trailer for the Red Dawn remake finally debuted, it's clear that it should never have been made, primarily because Patrick Swayze was so damn cool in the original mm. version. Remaking Roadhouse would be a Swayze Village. The, the term that you're thinking of, however, is the double whammy. That's what we that's what we called it. Uh, the really? double whammy. Okay. When you watch a movie you've cherished since childhood and haven't seen since then, only to find that it is not as good as you remembered, but also that you have now ruined the memory you had of it. <laughs> and the origin, do you remember the origin of that term? Um, what have we talked about that that ended up being a big disappointment? Um, oh. Well, I, I, I guess it would, <laughs> wouldn't be um, under the cherry moon for you. No, nope. no. Shut your mouth. <laughs> and no, I never... it was Rush. It oh, was Rush. Wow. Rewatching okay, okay. Rush was a real disappointment 
for Pete. He really loved the memory of the coolness of Jason Patrick and the hotness yeah. of Jennifer Jason Lee. But watching this film again really ruined that memory. He also realized just how much he didn't like the film. And the usage, we have sample usage because we were completionist and quite thorough uh, lexicographers. Usage. I rewatched Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings and man, what a double oh, whammy. <laughs> yeah, that was a double whammy. Good example there. Yeah. So the double Man, whammy. We need to we need to make that um a thing. We need to go back and <laughs> of course I don't clean think we've that, come clean up that I don't think we've come up with any good terms probably Well, since we then. stopped pra- we stopped making it a practice. Yeah, we, we need did. to just make it a practice. But we I love that it actually has first used rush. You can click right on it. It'll that. take you right to the rush film. That's fantastic. <laughs> so smart. Good stuff. Well, oh, this right. this definitely was a double whammy. Of a yeah. film, you know, because uh, now I have these tainted memories of it. And um, and now I know if I ever want to revisit the Buffy verse that I will just go to the TV show. Go you know me, TV I show. probably won't. But if you I do, won't. that's the direction I'll take. So, yeah. Oh, well. Well, there we sit. Well, everybody, we'll be right back for our ratings. But first, here's the trailer for next week's movie, Amy Heckerling's Clueless. So, Okay. Like right now, for example, the Hadians need to come to America. But some people are all, what about the strain on our resources? And it's like when I had this garden party for my father's birthday, right? People came that like did not RSVP. So I was like totally bugging. I had to haul ass to the kitchen, squish in extra place settings, and like people were on mismatched chairs and all. But by the end of the day, it was like the more the merrier. And so if the government could just get to the kitchen, rearrange some things, we could certainly party with the Hadians. Wow. You guys talk like grown ups. Oh, well, this is a really good school. <laughs> Mr. Hall was way harsh. He gave me a C minus. <laughs> well, he gave me a C, which drags down my entire average. Hello? There was a stop sign. I totally paused. You tried driving in platforms. Oh, should I write them a note? <gasps> Ew, get off of me. Ah, as if. Cher's got attitude about high school boys. It's a personal choice every woman has got to make for themselves. Cher is saving herself for Luke Perry. Cher, you're a virgin? I mean, I'm not prude. I'm just highly selective. I mean, you see how picky I am about my shoes, and they only go on my feet. Nice stems. Thanks. What the hell is that? A dress. Says who? Calvin Klein. I'm gonna be a supermodel. What are you doing? Yo, you're getting on the freeway! Get on this thing! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! You go, girl. Are you okay? Uh, I'm fine. <laughs> Whatever. Did I miss something? This big hair back? Uh-huh. Amber, my plastic surgeon doesn't want me doing any activity where balls fly at my nose. Well, there goes your social life. I'm gonna be a supermodel. Letterboxd, Andy. Uh, ugh. How are you gonna do it? You know, I, I struggle with this because it is a double whammy. But I also think back to things like The Way to Water, which I think I gave a half star to. And now I'm like, I kind of regret giving that half star because was it really that bad? I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's not a great film for sure. It's a it's all over the place totally. It, it, it has these two stories that don't feel connected. This film also feels just like a big old stink bomb. I, you know, I don't know. I I feel like a half star is too low. You know, I mean, it. Ha- Paul Rubens is always great to watch. Um, I like the look of some of the characters. Uh, you know, I like the the design and stuff. I I don't know. I feel like I'm going to say one and a half. No heart. I uh, I think we're ending up at the same place, uh, though we're getting there by a different route. I feel like it's not a good movie. It it is something that sort of start something greater for me. I have to, on that front, give it a heart. But the not great movie part, it's a one-star film for sure. 
for me. And, you know, obviously, Pete, no half stars, right? Um, it can't be a half star or one and a half. It's got to be a one star. Uh, but I am going to give it a heart just because of of what the whole property has meant to me watching it with my family and like the, the, the experience is, is positive. So uh, it's OK. It's yeah. a kind of a trashy film. One star heart. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Well, that's where we're going to sit over on Letterboxd. This is going to land at one and a quarter stars with a heart. Uh, that'll round to one and a half. That's where it's going to sit when we po- post it over there. Um, so that's where we landed. What do you think? about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We want to know. Hop into the Show Talk channel over in our Discord community. We will be talking this week about this very movie. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Uh, Okay, another quiz, Andy. Another quiz while you're getting your letterbox review ready. What is the Spielberg spank? Um, oh, the Spielberg spank. Let's see. I know we had another Spielberg term that related to the fact that things didn't exist until they were seen because there was the whole thing in the Indiana Jones series where, you know, the way that Spielberg would frame things the characters don't even see it until we as the audience can see it. So that's, but I don't think that's the Spielberg spank. That would be Spielberg spank. God, I'm blanking that one. You want me to just tell you, or do you want to fish around some more? Yeah. Tell me what movie it came from and maybe that'll help me. Indiana Jones and the kingdom of the crystal skull. Oh, that doesn't help me. November 12th, 2012. So th- okay, that di- okay, November twelfth, two thousand twelve. That's when we came up with the term. Yeah. So that was not from Crystal Skull because that was a well. No, I take it back. Episode. That's when it was. That's when. That's when the post is dated. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, using a nonsensical plot device to get rid of an antagonistic character, especially when in heavy pursuit of a protagonist and or others on the protagonist side. The origins. After Marion drives Indiana Jones and company off a cliff, they land on a conveniently placed tree that lowers them down, dropping them somewhat gently onto the river below. After losing the excess weight, the tree swings back up and smacks the Russians, now in heavy pursuit on the cliff face, knocking them off the cliff, also known as the McCarthy spank, as we jokingly said that McCarthy had trained those trees to treat Russians this way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the usage, the sample usage is, boy, the velociraptors sure got the Spielberg spank when the T-Rex conveniently burst into the building and attacked them, allowing humans to escape. So, Spielberg spank. The Spielberg spank. That's great. Uh, Letterbox give it, Andrew. As Letterboxd always doeth. Oh, you're really bringing the sauce I'm right bringing now. the berry. Oh, man. Mm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go first because I think mine is shorter. Do it. And it's from Shut Up Max. Uh, and it's a half star says, what a vile piece of trash. Literally nothing to praise here. It looks more like a sitcom than an actual TV show. It's far from funny and even further from laughable. I mean, the film ends with a girl crying over prom sex she regrets. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. And it's played as getting her comeuppance. Makes your skin crawl far more than any of the horror aspects they put zero effort into. Can't believe Josh straight up moved Buffy isn't like other girls from hateful subtext to Buffy's literal stated arc. As glad as I am that Buffy got a second chance, I don't see a single reason why anyone would have seen potential in this garbage. Fetid, honestly. I can't. Okay, half star. Uh, I, I can't believe we didn't talk about the girl crying over prom sex, uh, mm. the prom sex rape, uh, which was horrific. I must have blacked it out after I said it was just a terrible, terrible, terrible thing that was played as a joke. It's played. That's that's why we didn't talk about it, because it's not only treated as a joke, it's treated as a credits joke, you know, during yes. the, this news yeah. report where we're just getting a montage of of silly things that that people are saying. I mean, any editor would have edited this stuff out before it ever made it to air. So as I was watching this, my eyes were rolling because I'm like, this is just purely here just for these character bits that are just so bad. 
And that one was just so incredibly offensive. It was just, it was painful how bad that particular uh, element came out. It was just, you know, I mean, I don't know what the intentions of even including it at that point in the film were. Yep. Nothing. Nonsense. Awful. What's yours? I have a two and a half by Single White Femalian. And this is what Single White Femalian has to say. I think I would like this more if, A, Joss Whedon hadn't written it, B, Joss Whedon hadn't written like half the male characters calling Buffy a bitch or dyke every 10 seconds. Agreed. C, Joss Whedon wasn't a gross bad writer. D, (laughs) there wasn't romance. E, most of the jokes hadn't fallen flat. F, Buffy and her crew weren't written as stupid mean girls. G, really my big thing is that I didn't like is the way that it was written at all. F you, Joss Whedon, you suck. This is some stuff I liked, though. A, Paul Rubens and David Arquette are good vampires, though. B, David Arquette is one of my favorite 90s doofuses, to be honest. C, that's it, really. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Doesn't doesn't play. Doesn't play. Doesn't. I want to go watch Zindagi Namalega Devara. That's the only thing I feel like could make me feel better right now. (laughs) You need to go watch RRR. That's what you need to watch. Oh, you're right. I should do that first. I should do that first. All right. Uh, Thanks, Letterboxd. Andy, it's hard to believe we've been having weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, you're telling me. Producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals has links to purchase the source material behind our adapted film discussions. Your purchases there help support the show at no extra cost. For the entirety of Season 11, we featured films directed by women. The only exceptions were some of our member bonus episodes. We talked about The Lure for our horror debuts series, which is a very loose adaptation of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Definitely miles from the Disney versions. (laughs) For our 10-year anniversary series, we covered We Need to Talk About Kevin, taken from the Lionel Shriver novel. Man, that was brilliant. And horrifying. Yeah. The Journalist series included Merrily We Go to Hell and The Weight of Water, adapted from Anita Shreve's bestseller. We filled some gaps in previous series with member bonus episodes on adaptations like Malcolm X, Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House, Cactus Flower, Wild at Heart, Life Force, and The Blues Brothers. Our John Hurd series looked at a trio of adaptations, Chilly Scenes of Winter from the novel by Ann Beatty, Awakenings based on Oliver Sacks' nonfiction book, and Rambling Rose adapted from the Calder Willingham novel. Two films in our Coming of Age debut series were adapted from books, The Virgin Suicides from Jeffrey Eugenides and The Diary of a Teenage Girl, Phoebe Gluckner's graphic novel. We had Queen of Cotway for our sports series based on Tim Crothers' nonfiction book. And Clueless kicked off our 90s comedy series, loosely adapted from Jane Austen's Emma. It totally took place in the 90s, though. <laughs> Find all of these books and more adaptations on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read from the movies we've covered. Visit thenextreel.com slash originals today. Oh,